Engineers today have a variety of career options. You could go work for a large corporation. You could raise money and start a startup. You could freelance and move from job to job with freedom. Or you could start a business with the goal of quickly becoming profitable. Cortland Allen was a guest on Software Engineering Daily a few months ago when he discussed Indie Hackers, a platform that he built to share the stories of engineers building businesses on their own and making money. We only touched the tip of the iceberg in our conversation, so I was excited to invite him to the first Software Engineering Daily meetup, which occurred earlier this month. Today we are republishing his talk, and I would love to hear your feedback on this format. We will be experimenting more with new hosts and new formats throughout 2017. And if you have ideas for the show, or if you're interested in hosting a show yourself and you think you would make a good host, please send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. Also, the first Software Engineering Daily meetup was fantastic. There were around 200 people there. We may have to cap attendance at the next one. It was really fun. Um, but please join the meetup group if you're interested in attending the next one. It'll probably be in San Francisco also, and we'll let you know when we schedule our next event if you sign up for the group. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Cortland Allen. Encapsula is a cloud service that protects applications from attackers and improves performance. Encapsula sits between customer requests and your servers, and it filters traffic, preventing it from ever reaching your servers. Botnets and denial-of-service attacks are recognized by Encapsula and blocked. This protects your API servers and your microservices from responding to unwanted requests. To try Encapsula, go to Encapsula.com slash SEDaily and get a month free for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Encapsula's API gives you control over the security and performance of your application. Whether you have a complex microservices architecture or a WordPress site, Encapsula has a global network of 30 data centers that optimize routing and cache your content. The same network of data centers that are filtering your content for attackers are operating as a CDN and speeding up your application. To try Encapsula today, go to encapsula.com slash SEDaily and check it out. Thanks to Encapsula for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. All right, cool. I'm all set up. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about making money online for software engineers. So first, let me introduce myself. I'm Cortland Allen. Um, like probably most of you, I'm a software developer. I've been making websites since I was about nine or 10 years old. Uh, in 2009, I graduated from MIT with a degree in computer science. And shortly thereafter, moved to San Francisco, where I've worked for a few startups and done my own thing and just basically coded a lot. Uh, but today, I'm not going to talk to you guys about code, which is probably why Jeff put me last. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you guys instead about making money, about being independent, and about solving problems. Right. Specifically, I'm going to tell you how to make money independently by solving people's problems. So it's not code, but it's still interesting stuff, or at least I think so. Uh, so let me tell you a story. About six months ago, I quit my job. Uh, I'd worked for three years as a contract web developer for various startups, and I'd had enough of it. I didn't think it was for me, and I really wanted to make money on my own independently, like I just talked about, so I quit. Uh, I said, I'm out. I'm done contracting. But there's a problem, as, as I'm sure you can guess, which is I was living in San Francisco in an overpriced, expensive apartment. I had no source of income. I was burning through my savings, and I didn't really have any great ideas. So I was like, OK, I've got to figure this out if I'm going to be able to pay rent, or I'm going to have to go back to getting a job, or I'm going to have to move somewhere less expensive. Um, so I went online and I started searching. And I started researching and re-researching until at some point I had kind of an aha moment. I came up with an idea. And it was more of a realization. And it was that I'm probably not the only programmer who is trying to make money online. Right? There are other people like me who are going through the exact same search that I'm going through. And it's a pretty safe bet to say that if I'm you know, average at doing research, that these other programmers, at least half of them, are worse than me at doing research. So why don't I take all the research and the stories that I've learned and put them on one place online 
so that other programmers can read about these things and learn how to make money online too. Uh, about three weeks later, in August, I launched Indie Hackers, my website. Now this is exactly five months ago to the day, January 11th, this was August 11th, 2016. How's the website done since then? I've had over 330,000 different people view the website almost 1.4 million times in the last four months, which is five months, which is way better than I thought it was gonna do uh, on the traffic side of things. And in terms of money, I'm making enough money to pay my rent now. Uh, every month it's increasing. I'm expecting my revenue to double from last month, so I regret nothing. I'm glad I took the plunge. <laughs> it could have gone a lot worse. Uh, <laughs> Besides traffic, there's also, you know, besides the money, there's also the good feeling of people actually liking what I built. Every day I wake up to different tweets and emails and comments from people and developers like you who've been to the website and said, I like this, you know, this is awesome, thank you for building this, which is something that I didn't get that much of as a contract web developer, and I have to say it's completely underrated to have people tell you how much they like something that you've built. So what is an ND hacker? What does that even mean, right? I think to understand it, you have to kind of understand uh, the status quo. So how do things work today? You probably work at an employer who builds something of value and delivers it to customers. Customers give your employer money, your employer pays you a small cut of that money. Now, this is a great system, it's worked for thousands of years. I'm not advocating that we get rid of it, uh, but there's you know, a small problem if you're on this end, which is your employer probably keeps the, the vast majority of the money that they make, right? Especially if you're a software engineer, if you work at Apple, they make, I don't know how many hundreds of billions of dollars, where does that go, right? Not to the software engineers, it goes into their bank offshore in Ireland, right? The whole idea of being an indie hacker is that you make money directly, right? You build something of value, you deliver it to customers and they pay you and there is no middleman, right? So theoretically, there's no cap on how much money you make, there's no boss you have to report to and show up to work every day, so you're independent financially, which means you're also independent in other ways, you're independent in the language that you use. You can use whatever you want. You can use whatever tools you want. You can build whatever product you want. You can be in whatever industry you want. You can work whatever hours you want. You can work from wherever you want. I'm gonna share some stories later about some indie hackers who are working as digital nomads traveling the world while building their businesses. Uh, and it doesn't really matter how much money you make. You can make between $5,000 a year. You can make a million dollars a year. If you're making some part of your income independently, then I would consider you to be an indie hacker. And so far, I've talked to about 100 different people who are ND hackers. Um, every single person that I interview, I ask them to share their revenue on the site. And every single one of them has shared their revenue. So when you're reading about these stories, you're not just reading about some random web app or some random mobile app, you actually know exactly how well it's doing because you know how much money it makes. And I think that really puts things in context and helps you to learn. So who are these people? Right, who are these people that I'm talking to who are making their own money? They are generally people just like us. 80% of the people that I've talked to are developers, and the rest who aren't developers generally hire developers to do their work or partner with the developer. 60% of them are working on side projects. Right, they're either employed full-time or they're contract developers, so they're still working their jobs while making money on the side, so this is not something where you have to, to quit. Uh, the thing is, like, none of these people are Mark Zuckerberg, right? You've probably never heard of most of them because they're not making you know, $10 billion a year and changing the face of society as we know it. They're providing a small supplemental income for themselves or a developer salary or two. Uh, so what does that income look like? The median income of a person that I've interviewed is $2,900 per month, which is not a small amount, especially if you consider that mostly they're side projects. If you multiply that by 12, it's about $35,000 a year, and I don't know about you guys, but I would take a $35,000 a year raise any day. Uh, so probably at this point, some of you guys have doubts. Right? You're probably thinking, I don't have any ideas, right? How could I do this if I don't have a good idea? I've never had brilliant ideas. This doesn't seem like it's for me. You might think, I don't know anything about business, right? I've been a programmer my entire life. I don't know how business works. I don't know how to do marketing or sales or how to make money or talk to customers. You might be thinking that you don't have the time, right? If you work a full-time job or if you have a family, then when are you gonna find the time to build a business on the side and make money? You might be thinking that it's too risky. Right? You don't wanna do what I did and risk not being able to pay your rent while you're doing some risky, crazy stuff on the side. 
Or you might be thinking that your coding skills aren't good enough, right? These must be genius hackers who are inventing completely new frameworks and ways of, of seeing you know, code and that's just beyond your level. I'm here to say that it's actually not that hard. It's not this insurmountable challenge. I think all of those concerns are totally reasonable. They make sense and it's actually smart to think about you know, the downsides and potential reasons why you might fail, but these are not insurmountable challenges. They're more like obstacles. Right, there are hurdles that you can jump over. All you really need to do is figure out the appropriate strategy to jump over them. So if there's one thing that you leave this talk here tonight thinking, it's that you got this shit. I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room has the skills to do anything that anybody I've interviewed has done, because I've talked to all 100 of them, and most of them have all of the same concerns, all of the same constraints, and they just figured out a strategy to get around them. And just because it's possible doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy, right? It's hard to start a business. It's a lot of work to start a business. Uh, and just because you have success, if you get there, it doesn't mean it's gonna happen overnight. It usually takes years. Right? Most of the people who've had what looks like overnight success have spent years and years and years learning, right? And so what you need to do is learn. And you're a programmer, so I assume that you like learning a lot, because you guys have already learned a whole bunch of stuff that most people in society would consider totally inscrutable, right? And if you're anything like me, you like learning by example. If I go to read the API documentation for uh, a new framework or something, I like it when they have lots of examples. And so when I was learning you know, what idea I should come up with, I spent my time learning by example. I would read stories that other people had written and try to figure out, okay, what's the common thread between these stories? Like, How did they get their idea, et cetera? Right? And so I've asked every single one of these people pretty much the exact same questions so that if you go to the site, and read the interviews, you can compare and contrast. I've asked them, how did you get your idea? How did you find the time and the funding to work on your project considering you had a full-time job? How did you market it and get your first users? How did you charge money and actually get people to pay for this? What kinds of challenges did you face, et cetera, et cetera? Everybody gets the same questions. You can go there, and if you learn by example, I guarantee you, you'll learn a lot by reading the interviews. So the question is, when is a good time to start? And the answer is now. I firmly believe that 2017 is probably the best time there's ever been to be an indie hacker and start your own business. And I believe that for four reasons. Uh, before we get on those reasons, let's see the objections. A lot of people say that, you know, back in my day, it was, it was uphill both ways in the snow, right? I had to walk straight up a hill to start a company. I think in a lot of ways, that's actually true, right? Number one, today tech is everywhere. No matter what it is that you're trying to do, you can build your platform, you can build your company or your app or whatever it is you want to make off the back of limitless choices of tech, right? Amazon Web Services, you, never, you no longer have to set up your own server, you can be on AWS. You no longer have to roll out your own payments framework, right? You can use Stripe. As recently as a few years ago, people were spending months trying to accept payments. Today, it's like, it takes an hour tops to set up. Two, tech is more powerful than ever, right? No matter how hard what you're trying to do is, you can save yourself a ton of time and end up building a bigger business that scales way more than business in the past. Uh, one guy I talked to, Mike Carson, has a, a website, Park.io. He's the only employee, and he describes his business as having 50 employees, because he's automated everything, right? He's automated pretty much every single task in his business. He makes a million dollars a year by himself, right? Because he's got the power of 50 employees, because he's using technology that didn't exist 10 years ago to enable him to do a lot more stuff. Now, if you want to build a super sleek, single page web app, you can use React or Ember or Angular. If you want to come up with a really good logo design, but you don't have the bandwidth or you're not a good designer, you can use LogoJoy. And AI will design you a good logo for your website. All right, so it's easier than ever. Number three, there's more information out there than ever. Right? There's all sorts of great books of people who've done it before who will tell you exactly what you need to avoid exactly what you need to do. You don't have to wing it, right? This is something that cannot be understated. Five, 10 years ago, there was nothing. If you wanted to do this, there was no path. You just had to figure it out on your own. And today, you can read anything. You can go on Twitter and you can talk to the people who founded successful companies. They're online sharing literally all of their secrets. They can't wait to talk about what they're doing. You can follow the right people and hear what they're saying and actually ask them questions. You can get on Hacker News, ask for feedback. You can get on the Indie Hackers Forum and ask for feedback, and people will share their ideas and their information with you and let you know what they think about your ideas. So this is something that exists today that didn't exist before and is extremely advantageous. And number four, the internet is more popular than ever. There are more people on the internet than there have ever been. That number is only going to keep growing. People are more comfortable 
buying stuff on the internet than they've ever been. I remember like 16 years ago, I was a kid in high school and I wanted to buy something off eBay. And my mom was like, are you crazy? If you put your credit card on the internet, it will get stolen guaranteed. And today she buys more stuff online than I do. Um, grandparents use en the internet, kids use the internet. There's a story the other day about a, a girl ordering a dollhouse off Amazon Alexa, right? People are buying things online and spending way more money online than ever before, so it's the perfect time to build a business and actually make money. Now you're probably thinking, doesn't this mean there's more competition, right? If, there's so, if it's so easy today and it's so, there's so many people online, aren't there gonna be a ton of other people starting businesses? And that's true, but it's actually not a bad thing, right? This is a good example of a rising tide lifts all boats because there's more competition, which means there's more people starting businesses, which means there's more people writing about it so you can learn about it, and it doesn't really affect your business because most markets are not winner-take-all markets, right? There's about a thousand analytics companies out there that are all making a lot of money selling analytics tools to people, so you don't need to worry about the competition. And in addition, you're not trying to become the next Facebook, right? You're not trying to build a billion dollar company, you're trying to pay for a salary, like a single developer salary, right? So if you look at the math behind that, let's say you charge $50 a month for a product that you build, how many people do you really need to make $10,000 a month? 200 customers, right? It doesn't matter who has a competing product out there, you can find 200 people pretty easily. It's not that many. So you can do it, now is a good time to do it. Third question is how you actually get into this, like how do you build a company? Couchbase is a NoSQL database that powers digital businesses. Developers around the world choose Couchbase for its advantages in data model flexibility, elastic scalability, performance, and 24 by 365 availability to build enterprise web, mobile, and IoT applications. The Couchbase platform includes Couchbase, Couchbase Lite, which is the first mobile NoSQL database, and Couchbase Sync Gateway. Couchbase is designed for global deployments with configurable cross data center replication to increase data locality and availability. Running Couchbase in containers on Docker, Kubernetes, Mesos, or Red Hat OpenShift is easy, and at developer.couchbase.com, you can find tutorials on how to build out your Couchbase deployment. All Couchbase products are open source projects. Couchbase customers include industry leaders like AOL, Amadeus, AT&T, Cisco, Comcast, Concur, Disney, Dixons, eBay, General Electric, Marriott, Neiman Marcus, PayPal, Ryanair, Rakuten slash Viber, Tesco, Verizon, Wells Fargo, as well as hundreds of other household names. Thanks to Couchbase for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We really appreciate it. From a high level, it's pretty simple. You build something, you make it available, and people pay you for it. All right, that's the <laughs> it's really simple to understand. It's a lot harder to actually do. Right? Most businesses fail. And then the people who didn't fail have learned the hard way over the course of many, many years of building companies, failing, learning from their mistakes, and repeating. But it's 2017, and you guys are going to learn the smart way, not the hard way. And what is the smart way? This is Benjamin Franklin. He's got a quote that I live by, and I think you guys should live by it too. It's, experience keeps a dear school, but a fool will learn in no other and seldom in that. And it's said another way by Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner. My prescription for misery is to learn everything you possibly can from your own personal experience, minimizing what you learn vicariously from the good and bad experiences of others, right? So what they're both saying is that don't make all the mistakes yourself, right? Other people have made these mistakes. You don't wanna spend three years making the same mistake that someone else has made and written a book about when you could spend an hour reading the book, right? Now, some people will say you need to stop reading and start doing. This is something that I hear all the time, constantly. Stop reading and get out there and start hacking. And I, I think this advice, honestly, is, is terrible advice. It's not good. Right? You want to be like Goldilocks. She is a fucking genius. Right? She, didn't want, <laughs> she didn't want the cold porridge. She didn't want the hot porridge. She wanted the porridge that was just right. right? Similarly, you don't want to jump in having read nothing and just repeat the mistakes that everybody else has made. You don't want to spend five years of your life reading and never building anything. You want to learn just the right amount of information and then get started. So what is that right amount of information? 
I think what you need is a learning framework. And by that, I mean you need some sort of structure for learning so that you know how far you've gotten, how far you've come, and what you need to learn, right? So it's a way to set predefined goals. It's a way to organize the things that you're learning. So you're not just learning random stuff willy-nilly like a lot of people do and just floundering around. My recommendation is that you need about 100, this is an approximate number, about 100 what Charlie Munger calls mental models, right? These are just essential concepts that you should understand before you get into it. It's not that much, 100 sounds like a big number. It's about seven models a day for two weeks. And assuming it takes you about 10 minutes to learn a concept, that's like an hour a day for two weeks before I think you're ready to actually go out and do something. And this is assuming that you're starting from scratch and you know nothing about business. Um, most people, by the way, that I've interviewed have none like almost nothing and they've been able to be successful. So I think you guys are gonna get a huge head start. Uh, and people who don't, for example, have a framework, what they'll do is they'll go in and they'll read the same advice over and over, right? There's maybe five or 10 models and, and pieces of advice you see repeated over and over and over again. If you don't have a framework, if you don't know there's like 100, you might read 10 articles, learn the same things and not search for the other things. So that's why I think it's important to understand like about the amount of information you wanna get. Uh, two caveats, number one, uh, people. You're never going to be done learning. There's never gonna be a magic point where it's like, okay, I never need to learn anything again. So one of my biggest re recommendations is to continue talking to people no matter what. All right, get on the Indie Hackers forum, get on Twitter, ask people for advice on everything. That's what I do. If I have an idea, I tweet about it and people give me their advice. If something's not working out, I post about it and people give me their advice. It's really good to have a sounding board from other people who are doing the same thing. And number two, keep a checklist. Uh, for those who haven't heard of a checklist, it's this really radical ancient invention that allows you to not forget stuff. Um, when you're learning all these things, you're probably not going to remember all 100 things that you learn. What you should do is write down one or two sentences about each one, and then whenever you need to make an important business decision, just consult your checklist. It doesn't happen that often. It'll take you five or 10 minutes to run through it, and it'll help you avoid making mistakes that you already read about, which is the worst feeling in the world. Um, so my first recommendation is to read the personal MBA. And I usually don't endorse books, but I read this recently, and I think it's an absolutely genius book. It's written by Josh Kaufman, and he's this guy who wanted to get an MBA but decided to go a different route, and he read like something like 2,000 business books. He read the absolute worst business books. He read the best business books. And he put all of his knowledge into one single book that you can read cover to cover in about five to six hours. In fact, you can skip the whole second half of it and just focus on the first half, and it will teach you like the basics of business that if you don't know because you're an engineer, you never thought about it, will be extremely enlightening, and I think it's actually a really fun read. I think just from reading this book, you'll get about 40 or 50 models and concepts that are important to learn, so I could not recommend this enough. And I think after reading this book and understanding the basics of business, it gets to the point where instead of companies seeming like unique snowflakes to you, you, you can kind of slot them into these predefined categories that you understand, and you'll understand the underlying forces behind how they work. So get this book, read it. Uh, what about the rest, right? What about all the other stuff you need to know? Like that's a pretty generic business book. It just teaches you about how all business works, but you're probably going to want to start an internet business. So where do you learn this stuff? So what I wanna do now is tell you a few stories, and then I'm gonna ask for your opinions on lessons that you can learn from these stories, and I'm gonna tell you some of the lessons that I've learned. And they're gonna be abbreviated stories from people that I've interviewed on Indie Hackers. So there's five different companies, um, each one making a different amount of money, but they're all doing pretty well and they're people that I've been interviewing since August. So we'll start off with Formcraft. <clears throat> Formcraft is a form builder and survey tool. It makes $13,500 a month. It's created by Nit Nishant Agrawal, and I talked to him last August. He's one of the first interviews that I did. So in 2013, Nishant was living in India. He was studying accounting, and he wanted to learn how to code because he wanted to be able to pay his $100 a month rent, and he figured learning to code would be useful. He ended up deciding to create a tax filing website because he was an accountant and was studying accounting and he thought that would be useful. And so he learned to code for six months while building this website and nothing ever came of it. Nobody used it and he quit the tax filing website. But he did not stop learning to code. He kept learning, he kept browsing the web and eventually he stumbled upon CodeCanyon.net. Now Code Canyon, for those who don't know, is a code marketplace. It's where people who don't know how to code but maybe have a WordPress site can go and buy a plugin for their WordPress site or buy a snippet of code to put on their site. And out of curiosity, since he had made so many forms for his tax filing website, he checked out the form builder on Code Canyon, and it sucked. It was at the very top of the rankings. He used it, it was ugly, it barely worked. He's like, I can do better. 
So Nishant spent another six months building a new startup, a form builder, and he put it in Code Canyon. And his first month he made from people buying his plugin. Uh, three years later, he's now making $160,000 a year. He's not an accountant, he's just working on his form builder. Uh, so let's think about some concepts that we can learn from this. And for this one, I'll just give you some concepts, and for the next one, I'll, I'll ask you guys what you think we can learn. Uh, the first thing, I think, is that you want to have a simple idea. Nishant's idea was not some mathematically genius new invention, right? He was making a form builder. There's plenty of form builders out there. It's not that creative an idea. He just did it a little bit better than the other guys, right? The second thing is the positive sum game. Right? A lot of you have heard the term zero sum game or a winner take all market. Positive sum game is one in which multiple people can win. Uh, it's a lot better if you're trying to make a little bit of money for yourself to play a positive sum game where you don't have to crush your competitors into dust just to survive, right? You don't want to make the next photo sharing app and try to compete with Facebook or a social network because you're gonna lose that fight and it's gonna suck. So enter a market where lots of people can win. There's lots of form builders. There's lots of analytics tools. There's lots of task managers that people pay for successfully. Uh, so this is a pretty good concept and very often people get both of these wrong. People do complex ideas, they do winner take all markets and then they wonder why their business didn't succeed. Third thing was he charged money. He made $1,500 in his first month. He did not give away his product for free, right? If you're trying to become the next Facebook, it makes sense to be free, right? And that's what's kind of drilled into our minds over and over. You need as many users as possible so that your VCs can get a return on their investment. But if you're trying to be an indie hacker and make five or $10,000 a month, charge money and do something that you know people will pay for in advance. Finally, he found a good distribution channel. Right? There's no part of the story where he was marketing and selling and calling up users on the phone to get them to use his form builder because he put it in a great store that took care of marketing for him, right? Presumably tens of thousands of people were coming to codecanyon.net and downloading the code there and he didn't have to lift a finger to access any of them, right? And you guys all know distribution channels. The App Store, the Google Apps Marketplace, Walmart is a distribution channel that sells other people's goods. Uh, and there's distribution channels for the web too and Code Canyon is one of them, right? So if you can, find a good distribution channel for your product. So on to the next story. It's, this one's called Fundraising Report Card. Uh, they do fundraising analytics for nonprofits. It's by Zach Shevska and he makes $7,500 a month. So Zach's story starts in, I think, 2012. He was working as a front-end software engineer for a company that made software for nonprofit companies. And at some point, a CEO came up to him and said, Zach, I think we could do some sort of analytics software because all of our nonprofits are terrible at Excel and they don't know how to graph all their analytics when they're raising money. So Zach said, okay. And he put together a single page demo in a matter of hours. It was just an HTML page. I think he used chart.js for the graphs. And he put a bunch of dummy data in there and he went to 10 different nonprofit customers and said, hey, would this be useful? Would you guys like to use something like this? And every one of them was like, this is amazing. So he got super excited and he started building his product and eventually got to a beta and he started using it with some customers. And at first they hated it. He talked to a well-known consultant in the nonprofit space and she spent an hour grilling him over the phone about how shitty his product was and how she was never gonna use it. And she was using all sorts of terminology and all sorts of acronyms that he had no idea what they meant, right? She schooled him for an hour on the phone. But over time, he got better. He kept talking to his customers. He kept improving the product. And it got to the point where people started paying for it. And he would go on LinkedIn groups. And whenever anyone mentioned fundraising, he would mention his product and they would use it and start paying for it. And then he started writing blog posts about all the things that he learned to help nonprofits do things like track their donor metrics. Uh, in 2016, he made $100,000 from this app, and on 2017, they're planning to make $500,000 from this app, so they've grown quite a lot. So the question is, what lessons can you learn from this example? Does anyone have any? Jeff? Prototype. Prototype, exactly. Also known as validating by creating an MVP, right? A minimum viable product. That's when you create a really, really simple version of your product that doesn't take very much time and you test it out on customers. So what Zach did was he made a one page mock-up to see, just to gauge interest and show it to people and say, okay, is this something you're actually going to find useful, right? It seems obvious, but it's not obvious. And most people will spend five or six months wasting their time on an idea that's not that great and end up regretting it. So that's a really good lesson to learn. If you're gonna build something, make sure you know people actually want it, right? Test it out, 
make a prototype. What other lessons? If the customer cares about it, they'll complain. What was that? If the customer cares about your product, don't complain. Yeah, if the customer cares about your product, don't complain. In other words, talking to customers, right? How do you talk to customers, right? The first thing you need to do is actually talk to them, right? Then you can not complain, but talking to customers is crucial because if you think about it, you might have an idea of what your product should look like. You might have an idea of who's gonna use it, of how much they're gonna pay for it, of what features they're gonna care about. But all of those ideas are just guesses, right? Until people are actually paying for your product or whatever it is that you built, you're just guessing at what they care about. And so by talking to customers, you're actually bringing your hypotheses into line with reality. This is another reason why it's good to build an MVP or a prototype, because you need to get your ideas in contact with reality as fast as possible so you can disprove all of your mistaken hypotheses before you spend six months building something that nobody wants, right? So Zach was talking to customers the entire time, and he wasn't just emailing them, he was getting on the phone with them and finding out what is it that's gonna make you buy this product or not. Right? People share way more information over the phone, and it's not that hard to call up them up and usually customers love to talk to you about what's gonna go in your product. So whatever you do, talk to customers. Don't hide in a hole for six months while you build something without talking to anyone. Another thing is niche marketing, right? So first, to understand what niche marketing is, you have to understand what marketing is, and it's a really simple concept. It's, it's two things. Number one, how do you get your product in front of a customer? And number two, how do you get the customer interested in your product? You have to do both of those things. Niche marketing is when you pick a very small niche of people who all share a common characteristic and you target your product at them. And it's kind of counterintuitive at first because you're thinking, don't I want everybody to use my product? Don't I want to build a product that seven billion people will find useful like Dropbox or Facebook? And that's great if you're trying to build a billion dollar company, but it's really, really hard to do and going after that kills a lot of companies. When you think about the advantages of a niche, you're targeting a very specific customer, and that makes marketing way easier because what is marketing? Getting in front of them. Well, if you target a very specific customer, then you can figure out where they hang out, right? If I wanted to target programmers, I might say I'm gonna go on Reddit or Hacker News or Twitter because I know programmers live there, right? If I target everybody, I have no idea where to go, right? So niches help you target. They help you get customers interested, which is the second half of marketing. If I'm targeting programmers, I know what you guys like, right? You guys like programming languages and free tools and meetups, right? I can give you those things, right? If I target everybody, what does everybody like, right? There is nothing that everybody likes, so there's no way to get them interested. It's really hard. Uh, and finally, when you target a niche, it helps your product spread, right? If you target programmers, programmers talk to other programmers. If you build an app that programmers like, then they'll talk to other programmers and meetups and at work and share your app, right? But if you build like an app for construction workers and for teachers and for lawyers, None of those people talk to each other. There is no internet forum where they're going to share your product and you're going to wonder why it's so hard for your product to grow. It's because nobody's talking about it because they don't know each other. So don't build a product for everyone, build a product for a specific niche. And then finally, he did some content marketing. This is a good way to get people in the door. In his case, he learned so much about nonprofits and fundraising and analytics that he was able to actually share useful information with them that they themselves didn't know, right? So they would come read his articles, he would get high on Google because of the SEO because it was such a niche. He had very few competitors in that niche, even though he's an analytics company and there's a million analytics companies. And then they would read his articles and sign up for his product. So that's a great way to get people in the door. And if you're trying to get people in the door, I think this is a really good thing to do. But it requires you to actually know your audience. And it helps if you pick a niche so you know what they're interested in. All right, Sidekick. This is a business some of you guys have probably heard about. It's an open source background job framework for Ruby created by Mike Perham. He makes $80,000 a month, about a million dollars a year by himself. Uh, the story behind Sidekick is pretty simple. Mike Perham has been involved in the Ruby community and the open source community for years. He has a blog, and he noticed in about 2011 that none of the background job services for Ruby were really that good. He didn't like them, and he didn't want to use them, so he decided he would write his own open source background job processor by himself. But one of the problems he realized in open source was that people were continually abandoning projects. People would start things and they would build momentum and then they would just stop. And so he said, okay, I'm not gonna be one of those guys who quits, but I'm not going to work for free forever, probably. Like, I'm not always going to be as interested as I am, so what if I charge money? So he decided to add premium features to Sidekick that he would charge a monthly fee for, and not everybody would use them, but if you wanted a commercial license, you would have to pay Mike to access Sidekick. Uh, he talked to his audience, when he released the 
when he released the program. His audience he had built over his blog for years of Ruby developers and open source fans. And so he launched to an audience that wasn't zero people. He launched to an audience that already existed. And after 18 months, he was doing $10,000 a month. And now, as I said, he's doing a million a year. So what are some lessons we can learn from Mike? Any ideas? Build an audience. Charge money, and what was build an audience? Build an audience is a great one, right? Build an audience and charge money. It's the same lesson we learned earlier, and you'll notice that there's a lot of lessons that we learn over and over again. Yeah, exactly, right? The community you already have, and this is something that a lot of people I talk to do, right? There's something that they like, there's something they're interested in, they blog about it, they write about it, people start following them who are interested in the same thing, and then they launch a product and they already have thousands of people, or hundreds of people who are interested and could be their beta users, right? It's a lot easier than starting from zero, and it's kind of invisible. When you read people's stories, they never really mention it, right? Another thing he did was he solved his own problem. Right? This wasn't something that he was building for someone else like Zach and the fundraising report card. And when you solve your own problem, it's a huge advantage because it's a shortcut. Right? You don't have to talk to customers nearly as much, and your initial hypothesis is going to already be a lot more in line with reality because you're solving your own problem and you are your own customer. So whenever possible, if you have a problem and you're deciding between two ideas, pick the one that you understand more and that's your own problem. Uh, market timing. So, he released Sidekick in 2010, 2011, and Ruby has only grown since then. It gives him a unique advantage over other background job processors because he's got all the SEO, right? All the articles that have been written about background job processors talk about Sidekick because he's been around for five years and he got in there pretty early, right? And the flip side is also true, right? If you're not the first to launch, timing can also work to your advantage because you know who launched before you and you can read about the things that people hate about those so that software, right? Facebook came after MySpace, they could capitalize on all of MySpace's mistakes because they weren't the trailblazer. So depending on when you launch, you need to take whichever advantage you can get. Uh, as you mentioned, audience building, right? He built up an audience beforehand so he didn't launch his product to crickets. And then morale and motivation, which I think is important. Uh, I think people underestimate the psychological aspect of starting a company. It's really easy to quit. It's really easy to build something, get halfway through, and stop building. It's really easy to build something and not find customers and stop working on it. Mike thought about that. He decided that his main motivation would be money and he's going to charge up front. And he's been working on it to this day and it's one of the longer lasting open source projects. All right, next to last one, Creative 10. They were just on Hacker News a couple, a couple weeks ago. They were, their story was number one. Uh, they make UI kits, templates, and dashboards. They make $17,000 a month. So the story is Alex had a consulting agency that he ran and he did front end web development for different clients and he noticed that, hey, we're building the same thing over and over and over and over again. We keep building wizards, we keep building websites, we keep building modals. What if we could just build these things once and sell them to lots of people, right? And he realized that his consultancy's main strength was in good design. And so what he did was he went to Bootstrap and he just copied every single UI element that Bootstrap had, but he made it look really good, right? So you can get a better looking Bootstrap, it looks beautiful. And then he gave away part of it for free and then sold the rest of the elements for money, which, which makes a lot of sense because if you want your website to look good, you're probably gonna want all of it to look good, not just half of it. Um, he submitted the UI kit to Designer News, Hacker News, Product Hunt, any agency that he could think of, any website he could think of where people like new products and people like new designs. And he also sponsored hackathons where programmers wanted their projects to look good so they can win the hackathon. Uh, today, his products are constantly being featured. He keeps releasing new products, and they're always the same model. Some of them are free, some of them are paid. And the free ones always get featured in design magazines, and he keeps relaunching them on Hacker News and Product Hunt. And today, they're making $200,000 a month. Any lessons that we can learn from Creative Tim's story? Right, so he's not, right, he didn't start this from scratch, he bootstrapped off of bootstrap, <laughs> so to speak, right? He improved upon an existing product, and that means he already knew there was demand, right? He wasn't having to do this two-step process of create demand for something that didn't exist and then try to find customers. He said, people already like this, let me attach myself to this thing and then make money off of it. What else? Okay, monetize open source. So Bootstrap is open source, and he's actually making money off of it, right? There's all this code out there that exists. Jeff? Design is as rich and profitable as engineering is. Right. Design is important, so treat your designers nicely. Uh, 
that it's on core competencies, right? They were a design agency. Right? He stuck to what he was good at. He knows that he was good at design. He didn't try to build like some AI robot photo sharing app and have to learn a whole bunch of new stuff. He's like, I'm a good designer. People pay me for my designs. I'm gonna build a design product, right? If you're a Ruby developer, maybe you should build a product that targets Ruby developers or Ruby shops or people who are learning Ruby, right? Stick to your core competencies and do what you're good at and I guarantee you you'll launch something that's a lot more valuable than if you try to learn something completely new. Number two, always be launching. I don't know if you guys are fans of uh, always be closing, right? But it's always be launching, right? Launching is the easiest possible way to get traffic to your site. Right? You can launch an Hacker News. People care when you release something new. And a lot of people launch once and they think, well, that's it, I got this huge spike of users and I'm done and I have no idea how to get any more users. Well, a lot of businesses are amenable to launching constantly. Every single time they release a new UI kit, they make part of it free, they can launch again. It's a whole new launch event. They have a whole much more traffic that comes to their site. And I do the same thing with indie hackers, right? Once a month, I put a new interview on Hacker News, it drives a whole fresh new influx of traffic to the site. Compare this to like maybe a to-do list app where it's always incrementally improving and there's really nothing that's ever exciting added and you can never launch after your first launch, right? Whenever possible, realize that it's possible to always launch if you have a business where you're releasing new products. Uh, number three, relevant marketing. Right? He wasn't just marketing his app to anybody. He realized that the strength of his app was in design. And so he puts it on design websites where they're constantly featuring free UI kits, free icons, free whatever for the design community to look at. And he knew those people would be interested in what he's building, right? So he's doing relevant marketing. He's not just blasting it out to everybody, right? If you have a different company, let's say your company is targeting, I don't know, pizzerias, right? Well, pizzeria open owners don't hang out on design forums, so it wouldn't make any sense, right? What do they do? They like listen to the radio at work, so you might want to pay for radio ads. They go to conferences, so you might want to go to like, you know, pizzeria seminars, right? You need to understand who your customer is and advertise to your actual customer where they are, otherwise you're just wasting your time and money. And there's hundreds of different marketing channels and the way to do this is to actually talk to your customers, which we talked about earlier, and understand where they hang out and where they learn about new products. And then you can see all the old different ideas, the old mental models and concepts that apply to other businesses that also apply to him, right? So as you're doing your research online and reading and trying to spend two weeks learning about what to do, you're gonna see the same things come up over and over and over again. And those are the things you wanna to add to your list. Every software project uses email. Every time an e-commerce site processes a transaction or a user makes a comment on a social network, email notifications are sent. SparkPost provides email delivery services for apps and websites. To try SparkPost and send 100,000 emails a month for free, go to pages.sparkpost.com slash sedaily. SparkPost has a range of pricing options, from free self-service packages to sophisticated enterprise support and services. Start sending emails to your users today. Go to pages.sparkpost.com slash sedaily to send 100,000 emails a month for free. Thanks to SparkPost for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And if you want to send 100,000 emails a month for free, go to pages.sparkpost.com slash sedaily. And then the last example is StormMapper by Tyler Tringas. It's a store locator software. He makes $21,000 a month from it. Uh, in 2012, Tyler was working as a contract developer for clients on the Shopify store. So he was just doing random requests for people who had Shopify stores and didn't know how to code. Uh, within, I think, a week, he had two or three clients ask him for a store locator, which if you don't know what that is, it's you go on a website and it's just a map of that store's locations. They're both like, Tyler, we need a store locator. So we went online to try to find one, and there wasn't one that he thought was good enough for his clients. So he made a mental note. He said, next time I've got some time, I'll build one from scratch, and I'll just do it really quick because I don't want to waste a lot of time on it. So he was on a plane. He's like a, he loves traveling. He was on a plane. He got a long layover, and in the span of about 36 hours on two flights and one layover, he built a store locator thing. But then he did something pretty smart. Instead of giving the store locator to his clients, he emailed all of his clients and said, hey, I built this thing, pay me $5 a month and you can have it forever. 
Immediately on day one, he had three clients paying him $5 a month. 15 bucks a month is not that much to start off with, but it's, it's better than nothing, right? He immediately had validation that what he was doing was going to work for some people. So over the next few months, Tyler continued traveling the world. He's like a canonical digital nomad. He was working from beaches and all sorts of exotic cities, growing a, growing a startup, getting more customers, and doing all sorts of scrappy things. Like he would go to Upwork's forums and he would read job postings. And people would say, hey, I want a store locator SaaS. So are there any developers who can make this for me? And he would jump in and say, hey, I could build that for you, but actually I already built one and it's $5 a month, so why don't you use this? He was doing everything he could to get new customers. And he also was raising his prices. It started off at $5 a month, then it went to $9 a month, then it went to $19 a month, and he found that his customers never stopped joining, right? He was just doubling and tripling the price and he kept making more and more money. Uh, today he's making $250,000 a year by himself. I think he's hired a couple contractors to help him out. So what lessons can we learn from Tyler's story? Raise prices, right? <laughs> prices are completely malleable, right? There's no law or science of what your price can be. If you want to charge $10 million a year, you can put a price tag of $10 million a year of your app, on your app. The only way to know what customers are going to pay is to actually try it and measure the results, right? And if you read the personal MBA, it talks about uh, four different ways you can make more money. The most obvious one is we just talked about raise prices. You can find more customers. You can upsell customers to different things, right? So when they come in and buy one thing, you sell them a whole other product on top of that. Or you can get customers to come back more frequently. So I think too often people only ever consider finding more customers. There's three other ways to make more money. Um, another thing he did was manual sales efforts, right? He was actually reaching out to individual people and selling them on his product, which at first seems ridiculous because it's gonna take a lot of time. It makes a lot of sense because if you can't sell your product to one person, you're never gonna be able to sell it to thousands of people, right? Selling is a lot easier than marketing, right? You can talk to people, you can figure out exactly what it is that they want, and you can learn directly from their mouths why they're gonna buy your thing or why they're not gonna buy it, and you can fix the reasons that they're not gonna buy it. So whenever possible, early on, talk to your customers and ask them to pay. Uh, and this falls under doing things that don't scale. This is something that Paul Graham says all the time, right? It's really easy to look at a startup or a company that's in its latest stages and say, I'm gonna do whatever they did, right? And that makes almost no sense if you think about it because it's like walking into a gym and seeing a really strong guy and being like, I'm gonna lift 500 pounds, right? You're gonna get squashed, right? Similarly, if you're trying to copy what a company is doing in its later stages, that doesn't work at its earlier stages. You need to copy what companies did in their earlier stages so you can grow to that level, right? In this particular situation, Tyler was talking to people individually one at a time because he can do that as an individual, right? Google doesn't have the, the manpower to talk to every one of their customers and learn from them, but you can do that and it's a unique advantage when you're starting off. So figure out whatever things you can do that don't scale and that help you learn more about your customers and do those things early on. Raising prices, we talked about that. And then finally, retention and churn. So retention is a measure of how well your customers stick with you and churn is the opposite, right? How often do your customers leave? And when you're charging monthly recurring revenue, these are two really important concepts to think about. In Tyler's case, StoreMapper is a set it and forget it project, our type of product, right? You put it on your website, a business is never going to take their store locator off their website. They're never gonna stop paying that $5 a month, which means that every single time Tyler found a customer, he had a customer for life. That was $5 a month locked in. It's like your cable, your internet subscription. You pretty much don't cancel unless you move, right? Compare that to Creative Tim and their UI kits. They're selling things one time, their customers probably won't come back until they need to redesign another website, so every single month when they try to add a new thousand dollars of revenue or find 500 new customers, that's just all the money they're gonna get. All their other customers are gone, right? So if you're comparing two different ideas, think about how likely it is for customers to cancel. You know, something that might be in between these two extremes is like a task manager where a lot of people use it and for a long time a lot of people switch between task managers. Not quite as good as a set it and forget it project, but a little bit better than something where all of your customers pay once and then they're gone forever. Um, and then there's a few more concepts I wanna talk about and I'm done. So the first concept is to make sure advice is relevant. You're gonna hear all sorts of people telling you different advice and it's really easy, I like to talk earlier where he was talking about how people disagree. Uh, it's really easy to take advice that doesn't apply to you and think it applies to you. There's a guy on the Andy Hackers Forum a couple days ago, he was saying, hey, you know, I don't know why my idea's not working, I'm solving this problem that's unsolved and it's really difficult and isn't that what you're supposed to do? 
And I was like, no, it's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. That's what a venture capitalist will tell you to do so that you can do something really hard that no one's ever done before and build a $10 billion company, but that's not your goal. Right? Your goal is to make $10,000 a month, right? So don't do that, right? He should have thought a little bit more about what the advice was that applied to him, right? And similarly, there's advice that might apply to companies that are in the later stages, companies in the early stages, right? Companies in one industry, companies in another industry. So no matter what you read, make sure the advice actually applies to you. Um, Second one is code comes last. And this is specifically for you guys as software engineers. Your job as a software engineer is radically different than your job as somebody trying to create a product and sell it to customers. Right? When you're at work, you're thinking about things like best practices, you're thinking about things like unit testing and integration testing because you have one single solitary focus and that's to make the best software you possibly can. Right? But when you're starting a company and we're trying to release an app that people will pay for, you're wearing all sorts of different hats. You're the marketer, you're the sales guy, you're writing the copy, you're doing the design, you're deciding what goes into the product, you're doing every single thing. And if you spend all of your time obsessively focused on one area, right, trying to pick the best framework and trying to make all your code as battle tested as possible, you're neglecting every other area. Right? You need to cut corners. One of my favorite stories is from David Hauser, the founder of Grasshopper, who I talked to last week. He eventually built his company up to be $30 million a year. And he talked about early on in the beginning days when he would, customers would call him. And all they cared about was selling. They were trying to sell their product and they did the bare minimum on the coding side. So a customer would call and he was literally sitting there writing SQL queries to look up the customer's information because they hadn't built a dashboard yet, right? Like this is the kind of scrappiness that you need to have. Like your code doesn't matter, right? Do the least possible, get it into customers' hands and sell. Uh, third, focus on the problem. Right. It's really easy, especially as a programmer, to focus on a solution. It's fun to build your own app, right? You get addicted. You, you want to add this feature, you want to add that feature, but focusing on the solution and what features you want to add is not the same thing as focusing on solving the customer's problem, and it's a really easy way to build something that nobody wants. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a company, I think it was last year, who had a Kickstarter, and they made a cup, and it was a super high-tech cup where you pour liquid in it, and it tells you what liquid is in there, right? <laughs> like these guys, you can just see them sitting there so excited about how they're going to do this and how they're going to solve this problem and how they're going to get it to, to measure the, you know, the liquid. And they never thought once that like, you, know, you could just use a clear cup, right? They're not, they're not solving anyone's problems. It's a solved problem, right? So, and I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but all of us do that in a certain way too, just less, you know, less obvious when we... It's connected. <laughs> it's connected. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's got an API, you know, it works. It was so, it was so ingenious, like it doesn't matter, right? Customers are not paying you to be clever, they're not paying you to build the coolest thing that you want, they're paying you to solve some actual problems. So you need to actually understand their problem and you need to be obsessed with talking to customers and figuring out what it is that they care about, not just obsessed with the solution. And then the final thing that people ask a lot all the time is, okay, well how do I get ideas, right? You haven't talked about how to come up with an idea. Um, you find new ideas by, well, let me start by saying I think that ideas are really you just combining two different inputs and a novel way that other people haven't thought about and you come up with a new idea, right? So if you want to come up with new ideas that other people haven't thought about, you need to vary your inputs, right? I see a lot of companies that are all doing the same things. They're all started by a software developer in Silicon Valley who reads the same blogs that they do and reads the same books that they do and follows the same Twitter accounts that they do and it's like no surprise that they come up with the exact same ideas, right? What you want to do is change things up. Read a different book that other people haven't read before. Watch movies that people haven't read before. Read about businesses that people and tech aren't likely to read about, right? Don't read the same things that every other programmer is reading about and you'll end up coming up with different ideas. Uh, Isaac Asimov wrote this uh, I wanted to say blog post. He wrote a, a, an article like 50 years ago, and he was talking about evolution. And it's one of my favorite articles. He talked about how two people, Charles Darwin and another guy, came up with evolution at the same time. And he was looking at what these two people had in similar, and they both traveled the world examining different species, and they both read this article by Thomas Malthus on overpopulation and human societies. And it somehow the combination of doing these two things both led them to independently conceive of evolution. So that's just a good example of how having different inputs and unique inputs lead to different ideas. If you want to come up with your own unique ideas, you need to do things that other people haven't done before. You need to think in ways that other people haven't thought. And it's easier than you think, right? Like there are a lot of programmers 
there are a lot of programmers starting companies. There are not that many programmers starting companies who also you know, have traveled to South Africa, right? If you go there, you might encounter something that other people haven't done, right? Or if you had a fourth input, you've traveled to South Africa and also like golf, right? You might see something that other people haven't seen before. So if you find it hard to come up with ideas, try reading a different book, working a different job, visiting a different place, and hopefully you'll be inspired. And that's all I've got. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.